Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we're gonna to be talking about the new album from Arcade Fire, titled Reflector. Now the year was 2004, and indie rock was experiencing an unexpected and yet very welcome critical boom, courtesy of the success of acts like the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, Modest Mouse, Franz Ferdinand, The Killers, and a whole host of others who released a collection of strong singles and albums, all of which who would have mixed to diminishing success throughout the rest of the decade. Now, the band that left arguably the biggest mainstream cultural footprint would probably be The Killers, with the success of Mr. Brightside, Somebody Told Me, and All Things That I Have Done off of their great debut album, Hot Fuss. But the critical crosshairs were aimed at a very different band who also had their full-length debut this year, an album that would be widely acclaimed as one of the best of the decade. And you all know who I'm talking about. I, of course, I'm talking about Arcade Fire and their legendary debut album, Funeral. Now, I have to be honest here, for the longest time, I avoided to getting into Arcade Fire because there was a number of little things about this particular Canadian indie rock band that really got on my nerves. They had a degree of arrogant, humorless pretentiousness which got insufferable in large doses. Both vocalists could get more than a little grating at points, and the lyrics just didn't seem nearly as deep or as resonant as the band clearly thought they were. Coupled with Flaming Lips frontman Wayne Coyne's disparaging comments on how little he liked Arcade Fire's attitude towards their crew or their audience, it put me off looking into this band for a long, long time. But when churning through my backlog earlier this year, I decided to give the first three Arcade Fire albums a listen. And you know what? They're great. Possibly even classics. And while I do stand by all my complaints, meaning I will probably never love this band so much as like them and appreciate them, I do think that Arcade Fire has some real talent in composition and writing irresistibly catchy melodies with a wide variety of instruments. And say what you will about their lyrics, hit and miss though they are, they do have a fair amount of nuance in approaching big ideas that I can definitely appreciate. Most bands don't go for big ideas the same way anymore. Now Funeral, for instance, did a shockingly good job dissecting how human beings deal with death, and it yet managed not to get bogged down in the bleakness of it all. I can definitely see why it is critically adored to this day. Neon Bible, on the other hand, opted for the dark sophomore album route, and while it was significantly messier, it did a pretty good job all the same, although the tonal dissonance between the lyrics and the instrumentation occasionally did become questionable. Now The Suburbs, on the other hand, was perhaps the Arcade Fire's simplest album in terms of instrumentation and melodies, but it paid huge dividends in a surprisingly nuanced portrayal of suburban life and problems that called to mind the roots rock and Americana of the mid-70s. And on top of that, you could buy into the fact that the sentiments driving this album came from a very real place. So, with those three great albums going forward, I was a little encouraged going into the newest album, Reflector, even despite the initial mixed critical buzz. I mean, I've had contentious critical opinions. Hey, it, it couldn't be that bad, right? How'd it turn out? Oh God, oh Jesus. Um, I'm gonna get ripped apart for this because Reflector is a real mess. And while there are a few bright spots, this album really does not work. What's kind of perversely fascinating about Reflector is that on their own, the individual elements that composed this album could have worked with the right assembly, but put together in this way, the album reveals itself as a messy, incoherent record that manages to really get on my nerves more than it should. And I'll get back to that in a few minutes. Every critic on the planet has already branded this album as a bloated mess. And it is, let's make this clear. But bloated messes can work if they have a good purpose, and this album does not. And But it's not even that that really got to me. No, it's the, outs uh, it's the astounding and rather undeserved hubris behind Reflector that really sank it for me. It's the reason this album will not be getting a recommendation from me today. So, okay, let's start with the instrumentation. And this is gonna be a little tricky because what I'm going to describe for you here is probably going to make you want to run out and get this album. And I'd appreciate it if you listen until I fully articulate what my issue is. So here it is. This album sounds very much like a blend between early albums from The Cure, particularly in the guitar and melody lines, crossed with percussion in the vein of Talking Heads, mostly, with the darker synths drawn straight from an early 80s Michael Jackson record. It's more than a little jarring to see Wynn Butler trying on his best Robert Smith impression, mostly because he gets the vocal affectation uncannily right. Now, granted, I don't think the emotions behind his delivery really work, and Regine Chassonia's vocal delivery is so reminiscent of a flighty girl group singer that it's kind of a little unnerving. And all of this is delivered with the straightforward, earnest, hyper-earnestness of which Arcade Fire is legendary. And hell, I like earnestness. I like sincerity. So what's the problem? Well, here's the first one. 
The bloated songs really don't seem to gel well for me with this sort of instrumentation. Now, The Cure's early works were punchy and they were best in little short bursts. So whenever Arcade Fire just wheedles around and stretches their songs out interminably past four or five minutes, it just sounds needlessly indulgent, particularly when they aren't using that extra time to do anything special or say anything interesting. And the frustrating part is that so much of the instrumentation feels underweight and insubstantial without the thick, meaty drums that added potent weight to the suburb. In fact, there seems to be a number of significant problems at the lower end of the mix altogether. The drumming is cursory and barely even worth mentioning, with the exception of the bongos, which seem to be derived from the Haitian experiences that Wynn Butler had er earlier this year. And while the bass does have that rollicking quality reminiscent of the late 70s era they're cribbing this instrumentation from, it's not quite strong enough to support the sounds that Arcade Fire are trying to create on this record. It also doesn't help matters that this album is bookended by large tracks of meandering fuzz-saturated avant-garde noise, which does an impressive job killing the momentum that this album might carry at both the beginning and the end. And look, I've got a tolerance for ambient noise, but this does nothing. And it, it actually, I think, it even handicaps the album further. But look, to be completely fair, there's enough elements about this album that could work as good short pop songs. Hell, Joan of Arc is so goddamn catchy that I almost want to ignore the navel-gazing smugness of the song, or how Regine's cooing is such a big step down from her impassioned delivery on the suburbs. Now, the majority of this comes from, through in Wynn Butler's vocals. Sure, he sounds sincere, but there's this strange sort of sourness here that is re par definitely reflected in the instrumentation, particularly in some of the synths. It does lift slightly on the second half of the album, but it still left a distinctly bad taste in my mouth, and I was starting to get confused as of why. I mean, Wynn Butler still sounds earnest enough, so why the hell isn't things working here? Well, it's here where we're going to talk about the lyrics and thematic direction that Arcade Fire are trying to take this album in. And I'll be blunt and say it, because it's not a good one. And because once again, we have a musical act obsessed with their own fame and their own success. As I've said before, it's very rare that this sort of thing can be compelling to a mainstream audience because you have to provide enough detail and deeper context to articulate this insecurity and not make it come across as petulant or whiny or really kind of vapid. Kanye West partially ignored this problem by embracing the mad arrogance cultivated by his fame and his fan base and then skewering everybody with it on Yeezus. But let's be honest, it didn't even work mostly there. And that sort of maneuver requires the balls to go for broke and the absolute total lack of shame that Arcane Fire just do not have on this album. Instead, we get track after track of self-obsessed navel-gazing that show as much as Arcade Fire are concerned about their fame, they're too in love with their own reflections to do anything about it. And the problem becomes is that they aren't learning anything by looking in the mirror, it's all just on the surface. What's worse is that the concern surrounding fame and success on the sound sounds incredibly vapid, mostly because the instrumentation feels way too insubstantial to back up these emotions. Now, some of the persecution complex that was present on Neon Bible makes a return here, but without the greater weight bellied by the symphonic undertones of Neon Bible, songs like We Exist and Flashball Eyes and especially Normal Person, they just come across as obnoxious, with the earnest delivery of Wynn Butler completely flying in the face of like the lyrical content, which really would be barely tolerable under the best of circumstances. Of course, certain critics have been quick to point to Wynn Butler's series of influences for this album, namely an old French film titled Black Orpheus, which I advise you all see because it's pretty good, and which is something of a retelling of the Greek myth, which I'm going to assume you know. If you don't know, look it up. It's a, actually a good myth. So, okay, as a critic who has a more literary background, I'll play along and entertain the idea that Wynn Butler is the Orpheus of the title and the Eurydice, and the Eurydice is representative of, mm, well, the rest of the album's context would suggest that the audience responsible for Arcade Fire's fame. That's, the, that's Eurydice. Okay, so let's go into the two songs that best articulate the myth. Awful Sound, Oh Eurydice, and It's Never Over, Oh Orpheus. Now it's a straightforward recreation of the myth, and while I'm not really a fan of either song, I can recognize the symbolic interpretation. When Arcade Fire tries to connect with the audience or deliver their broader message and trying to come, come deliver some sort of deep, impassioned, emotional response, he can't always get that feeling of connection. And he loses it. And they just slip away. You know, come to think of it, that might actually make some sense, particularly considering Arcade Fire's reputation for being rather standoffish with their audience or the music. I can understand where that emotion might be coming from. And it would fit the paranoia with regards to fame, because he's have 
because he's feeling that he doesn't want to lose his audience, yet he doesn't feel he can look back and effectively communicate with them. Okay, that could work. But here's where the symbolism breaks down. The myth of Orpheus' failed retrieval of Eurydice from the underworld is linked to Orpheus' love. And when he looks back, she slips away. Tragic romance, solid symbolism, we're good here. However, if we're reinterpreting this relationship as arcade fire with its audience, the metaphor makes way too much sense in the worst possible way. Like Orpheus, Arcade Fire cannot fully trust the audience or fame under a disguise of affection. They don't think we're getting it, basically. And thus, throughout this album, we don't just get little snippets of paranoia, we also get condescension towards the audience in question, which flies in the face of the active populism that they tried to cultivate on the suburbs. Songs like You Already Know and Porno and Normal Person and Afterlife have this air of faux-tortured smugness. How Wynn Butler agonizes over being normal and how it is so painful to be conventional. Who are these normal people? Oh, we must not associate with them. It has such contempt for these val for the value set that he thinks these people have. And it either rings as completely disingenuous, because let's face it, Arcade Fire aren't the most innovative band when it comes to instrumentation and sound and particularly in their messages, even when it comes to this album, and they aren't certainly most of the unique and weird either, or it just comes across as obscenely arrogant with nothing to back it up. And you know, I just get this feeling that when he's singing about fame or his audience, he's singing under the assumption that we aren't listening or that we don't understand his mental through line, when in reality, it's not all that complicated to understand, particularly on this album. And when combined with the unsubstantial instrumentation, how much it feels like it was cribbed from the late 70s without any real swell or heft or any commentary on that particular brand of music, it just comes across as navel-gazing and a critically acclaimed and famous artist taking from the past and then talking into the mirror and saying, Woe is me, for I am rich and successful and critically acclaimed and famous, and yet my audience of normal people cannot understand my impo- oh, so important message. And then the rest of us in the audience clear our throats and rather awkwardly and we say, uh, you know we can hear you, right? And the, f the really sad thing is that that level of self-awareness on the part of Arcade Fire just doesn't exist, which ultimately culminates in my biggest problem of the album because the band shows that they have learned nothing. It's clear that Arcade Fire thinks that they're making some sort of grand, edifying statement on how an artist deals with fame and success and a change, a reflective self-commentary. Hell, it's no surprise they called in David Bowie as a cameo on the, on the title track, given his work and his relationship with fame. But the real issue is, is that for all the earnestness, the instrumentation feels like a hodgepodge cribbed from the past without a solid foundation, the technical songwriting still isn't very good, and... The, there isn't the slightest bit of self-awareness or self-discovery made on this album. Instead, it's just staring into the mirror completely myopically and murmuring, you're the only one who understands me, completely unaware of what he actually looks like to us on the outside. They didn't reach any sort of grand, edifying statement surrounding fame or critical success or even the myth of Orpheus. No, they just revealed to us their, us the audience, their myopia and their monstrous hubris. And let's be fair, their music isn't nearly unique or interesting enough on this album to back it up. The insubstantiality of this particular record just makes all the whinging come across as petulant, vapid, and shockingly obnoxious. And look, I know that somebody's going to make the argument and say, no, 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 that's all Arcade Fire's point. They're trying to make commentary on those who have a toxic and self-obsessive relationship with fame. Yeah, you know what? I don't buy it. I've already given this album probably way too much literary credit. I'm, I probably overthought this more than the band themselves have. But let's be honest, nowhere on this album is, this much, is there that level of self-awareness, particularly considering how the title track establishes the arrogant self-obsession and whininess about fame early on and it doesn't let up. It feels so incredibly dishonest in their lyrics, which flies completely in the face of the earnestness of the delivery. It just feels disingenuous to me. Or, let's put it another way. Nine Inch Nails did pretty much the exact same thematic through line this year with hesitation marks as Arcade Fire did with Reflector, an examination of past work and one's place with respect to their art and to their audience. And with songs like Copy of a, Disappointed in Everything, Trent Reznor came to more striking, impactful, and memorable conclusions surrounding his career, his fame, and his artistic role with respect to the music industry than Arcade Fire ever wished that they could. So, in short, too late, 
This is Arcade Fire's worst album by a long shot. It's not bad per se, despite my issues with the content, the music is still mostly somewhat functional, and there are a few high points with Joan of Arc being my favorite by a mile. And hell, you know what, I don't object to the artistic shift. They're pulling from some good ideas. As I said, if I had told you about the instrumentation initially, you would have gone out and gotten that album. It sounds cool. The problem is it's a badly executed artistic shift with a central album concept that only illuminates how much Arcade Fire is up their own ass and how much rancid contempt and dismissal they have for their audience, everybody else. This is an exploration of the myth of Orpheus, it's much closer to that of Narcissus. And look, while I can appreciate when an album is going for big ideas, as I said, we don't get enough of those, this record just goes in the wrong direction. Look, if you're a fan of Arcade Fire and you've drank the Kool-Aid, or if you think they have something that's deep and impactful and that speaks to you, or you are only listening to it for the music, okay, fine. Like, you can go ahead and love this album. But if you're not a fan, I advise you skip it. Go listen to Funeral, listen to The Suburbs. They're so much better than this. This is a five out of 10 from me. And really, it feels like I'm being generous considering how absolutely enraged I got after listening to it. When an album gets me this angry about its content and how much of a cataclysmic failure it is, I don't see how I can recommend this album. And look, Arcade Fire, you may have screamed out on this album that you exist. Oh, okay, I can accept that, I can appreciate that. But have some self-awareness, have some humility and try and think that, well, we get it. Trust the audience. We might actually come back in our heart to be able to trust you back. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. I know it's a bit of a negative review, but I'm just saying how I feel. And if you liked the album, I hope, I honestly hope you did, but I didn't see it, sorry. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. If there's anything I might be able to do to improve my presentation, or if there's any other things that I'm, any other albums that I, you might like me to take a look at, I'd be more than happy to take a listen. Until then, see you next time.